Join us as we plunge into this season's first Newton's Apple. We discover the science behind the terror of roller coasters, narrowly escape the clutches of quicksand, and wrestle a ferocious wild tiger. All of this and more on our season premiere. Welcome to Newton's Apple. Newton's Apple is made possible by a grant from DuPont, makers of better things for better living. And also by public television stations and viewers like you. And now your host, science correspondent, David Hyde. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome to another season of Newton's Apple. If you wonder about nature, technology, or the human body, or if you're just curious about the world around you, that's why we're here. From bee stings to boas, from volcanoes to spider webs, we'll answer more of your science questions this season on Newton's Apple. So let's go right to this first question of the season. It comes from Adam Baker of Lebanon, New Jersey, who asks, why does your stomach tickle when you go downhill in a roller coaster? You know, I can think of a few words besides tickle to describe a roller coaster ride. But in order to answer Adam's question, we sent our fearless field reporter, Peggy Knapp, to the Great America Amusement Park in Santa Clara, California. Hi, good to see you. Ah, amusement parks. The cotton candy, the games, the rides, the nausea. I don't like rides, any rides. They make me nervous. And not only that, they make me sick. So, of course, what did I have to ride on? Oh, no, 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 not the racing snails. I had to ride on something called the demon. It goes upside down. My guide for the day into the stomach-churning physics of roller coasters was Don Rathjen, a physics teacher at Foothill High School in Pleasanton, California. So this is exactly the kind of ride where I feel like I'm just going to lose my stomach and my lunch. Well, that's understandable. Why is that? Well, if you think about going off the top of the ride, mm -hmm. uh, we have mass, and that's yes. associated with inertia. That means we tend to keep going wherever we happen to be going. Right. Something has to redirect us. And if you come off the top of that hill, uh, and the car is going down on the track, and you tend to go out straight, you could fly right out of the car. Fly right out of the but car. But you got that harness there yeah. to keep you coming down, and so you're really sort of in between the seat and the harness. You're off the seat, not completely off, but lighter, and so everything inside here feels pressed together a little differently than it normally does. So and that's, your brain, your says, brain says, you're losing your stomach. That's it. Uh -huh. yeah. While you experience a certain degree of weightlessness over the peak of the hill, you experience the reverse at the bottom. Your inertia is now directed downward, but the cars of the roller coaster are being redirected up the next hill. So for a moment, your body is traveling down, the cars are coming up underneath you, and you feel pressed into your seat. This squashed feeling is so much fun that they've figured out a way to measure it. Uh, this is called an accelerometer, and notice that there's a fishing weight here. Mm -hmm. If you are holding this thing when the coaster comes up underneath you... And have the presence of mind to look at look it. Look at it. Well, the fishing weight has its inertia, and it wants to keep going, and the rubber band stretches, and if the fishing weight gets all the way down to two... Whoa! If the fishing weight gets all the way down to two, then that means you'll feel like you weigh twice as much as you normally do. If you're sitting on a bathroom scale, that's what it would show. And we call that a, a 2G force. What about the curves? Why do I get slammed into the side of the car and feel like I'm going to pitch right over the edge? Well, think about a, being in a car, a uh, regular car. You're going around a curve, taking a right turn. You may feel like you're thrown outward against the door. But if somebody's up top looking it down at you, they'll see your body with its inertia going straight ahead and the cars coming over and really redirecting you into that circle. What's pushing you and the car into the curve is something called centripetal force. It's the center-seeking force that all turning objects experience. And since I was soon to become a turning object, I guess I was going to experience it as well. You know they want me to ride one of these things. Well, we come back tomorrow and you could even uh, try the accelerometer. That's great. They're closed tomorrow. Oh, so much the better. Then we can have it all to ourselves. Oh, boy. 
Understanding the physics of what my body was about to go through somehow didn't make me feel any better. So I decided to find out how roller coasters work. Dana Morgan, a roller coaster designer in Scotts Valley, California, took me 100 feet in the air for an explanation. Good thing I don't have a problem with heights. What happens is that this chain that we see right here is powered by an electric motor uh -huh. at the base of the lift. The train engages this chain with the chain dog and is raised to here, mm -hmm. adding potential energy to the train. And then what happens after here? It goes over the top of this lift, beyond where the chain ends, uh -huh. and from there on back, it's gravity. It's just rolling after that? That's correct. Coaster, well, it's a roller coaster. Exactly. The first hill, or the lift of a roller coaster, is its highest point. This is the only place where energy is put into the ride by the motor and chain. At this point, the cars are poised at the top of the hill with potential energy, because they're in a position to fall downhill. Now gravity takes over, and the potential energy is converted into kinetic or moving energy. Now we've gone back up high again. We're fairly slow because we're almost as high as the top of the lift. Almost as high? Exactly. We can never go as high again as the top of the lift. Oh, why is that? Because we don't have enough energy to go any higher than the first lift. Oh, I see. The exchange of potential and kinetic energy continues up and down each hill for the rest of the ride. The cars slowing down as they gain energy and speeding up as they expend it. At the same time, the cars are losing some of their total energy to wind drag and friction, which gradually slows them down. So the whole ride really is balancing those factors, gravity, acceleration, deceleration, friction, wind drag. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's, it's a giant energy equation, really, and it's balanced such that when the train returns to the station, it has just enough velocity left that the brakes will stop it coming into the station. It was all making sense, but there was just one more question I wanted to ask. Why doesn't the car fall off the track? That's a very good question. It's a very good question. The train has three sets of wheels. It has road wheels, very much like those on an automobile, that it runs on. It has guide wheels that are set sideways, and they steer it, so they cause it to come around the corners. The third set of wheels are called upstop wheels. They are underneath the track, and they keep it from coming off the track. Those are particularly necessary on a ride that goes upside down. So. Yeah, yeah, so it's perfectly safe. Absolutely. All too soon, the big moment arrived. Just remember, three sets of wheels, absolutely safe. People pay money to ride this. Thanks. This is Steve, Hi, he's a fellow Steve. physics teacher. Hi, nice to meet you. And here's your accelerometer. Accelerometer, okay. Climb on in there. Okay. We'll get your harness fastened. There you go. Okay, okay. Steve, you in there? Well, you Johnny, you get in the back there? Oh, Peggy, I never ride these what? things. What? I get sick on these. What are you... Have a good what trip. You get sick on these See you things? later. Have a good hill for me. Okay, Steve. Hey, you ever ridden one of these before? No, I've never ridden one of these things before. Come on, do you know what we're doing right now? We're climbing an enormous hill. No, we're gaining gravitational potential energy. Oh, I see. That's fascinating. What happens when we get to the top? Well, it looks like we're going to go down. Yes, we gain kinetic energy, which is the same as... Uh, motion. Motion, velocity. Velocity, speed. Speed, yeah, yes. Well, when do we look at these things? Well, we'll look at these uh, accelerometers. Uh, when we get to the bottom of the first hill... We'll... This hill? Yes, we oh. get pressed into our seat. Uh-huh. Okay, ready? Uh -oh. Here we go. Oh, boy, this will make you sick. It's raining three G's three? now. Oh, my gosh. And now, you know, we've gained a lot of kinetic energy. It's a good thing, otherwise we fall out of our seats. What the heck of a thing to be saying to me right now? Are we gaining more kinetic energy now? Oh, uh, a little potential energy there. What's that? Uh, that's the corkscrew. The like, corkscrew. The corkscrew, that's right. Huh? And in the corkscrew, we'll be experiencing centripetal force. It's fascinating. And then it was over. I didn't feel great, but at least I didn't, uh, well, you know. Oh, there's Don. Hi, Don. Hey, welcome back. How was it? Uh, welcome to the Steven. Oh, thanks. Thanks, 
so much, you guys. Hey, I had such there. a great Thank time. Thank you. Thank oh, where you going? Where are you going? Good. Good. Rest a Just remember, physics is fun. Fun. And this from the man who wouldn't write it. I'm going home. More party trivia. Fascinating fact number 342, frogs. Frogs have to look before they leap. Once in the air, they are unable to see. At takeoff, the frog uses muscles to pull both eyes back into their sockets, protectively closing the lower lids over the delicate eyes. But a tree frog doesn't have to leap. Glands on the pads of its feet secrete a sticky substance that allows it to climb instead. Where's boy? Anyone who has ever watched a jungle adventure movie may get a sinking feeling when they hear the word quicksand. Bubbling pits of sand that pull villains down into the earth. That's probably what Shane Barclay of East Northport, New York was thinking of when he wrote us this letter and asked us, what is quicksand and how does it form? Well, here with the answer is our very own jungle physicist, Gerald Walker, author of The Flying Circus of Physics. Welcome, Gerald. David. You've uh, got me all dressed up in my jungle attire here. I suppose you're going to tell me we've got real quicksand in the studio. As a matter of fact, we got two collections of quicksand here. Of real quicksand? Real quicksand. Uh, you're not afraid of quicksand, are you? Of course I'm afraid of quicksand. I saw those Tarzan movies as a kid. In fact, I used to be worried about walking through the woods at night. Uh, you have nothing to worry about. Physics will save you in the case of a quicksand. Uh, let me show you the physics over here about all right. what quicksand is. Now, most people don't understand what quicksand is. Now, this isn't quicksand, is no, it? No, no, this is just normal, wet sand. That's what it looks like. But if we wanted to make this quicksand, we would have to supply one additional ingredient. We would have to make the water force its way up, like from some underground spring or something like that. So that makes it quicksand. That's right. Let me turn on some water pressure by increasing a pump down here. And oh, look. It looks, it's getting wetter on top here. That's right. That oh, water our house is, is being sinking. forced up. <laughs> oh, uh, look at this, an apple. <laughs> <that's> <laughs> Cute, <for> Gerald. <laughs> well, notice the house. It's, the house uh, is just disappearing yeah, here. It's I'm, on its way down. So now, the house sinks, but this apple bubbles up to the top. Why is that? Would the house eventually come back up as well? The house would never come back up because it is denser, because we've added some weights to this little model house. It is denser than this fluid of water and sand quicksand, at least when we had the pressure on. I've turned the pressure off, and we're going back down to just There's normal wet sand. Wet sand. Kind of quite trap this. Look at this house, right. so we can't even budge this thing. That's right. It's quite stuck because the sand is no longer being forced upward. Very dense object, denser than the sand water mixture, mm -hmm. will sink. A very light object, such as this apple, will float to the top. So just like the apple would float in regular water without the sand, it's going to float in this fluid mixture That's as well. Right. And as a matter of fact, you would float in quicksand in a way very similar to the way you float in water. Wait a minute, that's not the way I remember it. Those guys disappear pretty fast. They're like getting pulled right underneath the surface. Well, they take certain liberties in movies. Uh, come over here and let me show you the same physics on a grander scale. All right. Now, just for a moment, think of this as a large sand grain, okay? Very large sand <laughs> Very grain. large sand grain. <laughs> I'd like to levitate that, suspend it, kind of like over the sand grains over in the pit over there. But I can't use a water uh, stream, or I'm just make a big mess. What I'll use is air. When I push this button, I'll get an air stream. So I put this on the air stream. Right? Yeah, it's shooting up, and Dude, there it goes. It's okay. suspended. And there's uh, fluid, this time air, but it's kind of like water over there. The fluid is pushing the sand grain, maple leaf sand grain, upward and levitating it. In fact, you can even rock this over by an appreciable angle, and you still, still get the suspension. Yeah. So the water moving around all those sand grains in this tank keeps them all suspended, and that's what makes quicksand. That's right. Uh, as you can see here, when the water pressure pushes up all the sand grains, lifts them up, uh -huh. then they move away from each other. They no longer touch each other. There's no longer any friction between them. And now if we put something reasonably dense on top, 
it has the chance of sliding down into the quicksand. Through all these little spaces that have been created. That's right. Uh, something like if we were to put you on quicksand, you would slide down into the, all these little sand grains. Gerald, you keep bringing this idea up of putting me in quicksand. Now, wait a minute. As much convincing as you've done, I still envision myself sinking into this bottomless pit of quicksand. No, 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 David. If you were to go into quicksand, you would just sink in a little ways, just like the apple, and then you'd kind of float. Uh, I still need more convincing. <laughs> well, let's take a little walk up the hill We're here. headed into the jungle for this one, Yeah, huh? proper attire. I suppose you're going to make me go first. Well, you are the host, you know. All right. And what we got up here is a big vat. Of, of sand. Yeah, wet sand, though, that's all. And it's very firm and stable, and I'd like for you to step onto it. So this is uh, safe, huh? Uh, I don't Wait know. Wait a minute, Cheryl. <laughs> we'll know for sure when we turn the water what on. What kind of hesitation is that? So we're going to percolate water up through this. Wait a minute, Gerald. I can feel myself going down. Oh, well, the water's coming in. The water pressure's coming up. Boy, this is Guarantee exciting. Guarantee me a bottom on this thing, all right? <laughs> Woo. Oh, that is just great. It's cold. It's not quite tropical. <laughs> oh, oh this that. is weird. <laughs> You're sinking right down out of view. Yeah, that's very good, Gerald. Didn't I take wonder physics how... to figure that out, huh? <laughs> Oh, this is amazing stuff. It's just all around me. Oh, and if I do move, it really loosens up. One might wonder just how far you're going to yeah, sink just, down. I thought you said this wasn't bottom. No, no, no. no. Don't, <laughs> trust me on this. Trust me. Uh, you're going to sink down yeah, just so far, and then you get enough buoyancy to float. <laughs> just like that apple did. You're going in deeper than the apple, but see, you're floating. Boy, the sand just keeps moving up around you, too. Now, Gerald, if I were running through the woods and really fell into some of this, not in a controlled situation like I hope this is, <laughs> how would I get out? Well, I think the, the first rule to follow is don't panic. Because yeah. if you suddenly try to pull your legs out, the quicksand's going to hold on to you all that much more. Well, you got to admit, it's a natural tendency to try to do that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is, yeah. Actually, I can't pull my legs out anymore. What you need to do is to lie back on the quicksand and gradually pull your legs out, and then you can roll over to the shore and escape. Float on my back in quicksand. Yeah. That's, that's the technique for getting out. Right. It's the official technique. I can't do it here. It's, there's not enough room. Oh. Um, so uh, how am I going to get out of this one? How about the uh, traditional manner? Like what? The vine. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I could count on you, Gerald. <laughs> oh, if I can just get out of this quicksand, we'll be right back. a science question you'd like answered by Newton's Apple? Write us. Send your question to Newton's Apple, Box 1983, St. Paul, Minnesota, 55111. Remember, our show depends on your questions. Joey. Watch it. Ooh. Why does it always land jelly side down? I'm really glad you asked me that, Bob. What a mess. And it's all thanks to physics. A peanut butter and jelly sandwich that falls off the edge of your counter will land jelly side down every time. Well, almost every time. Now, you're probably thinking it's because the side of the bread that has the peanut butter and jelly on it is heavier than the side without the... F the empty side. Well, it's a good thought, but it's not exactly how it works. Let's have an instant replay. As I accidentally push my peanut butter and jelly sandwich off the edge of the counter, it doesn't fall straight down. As it approaches the floor, it starts to spin. Unfortunately, it only completed half a turn before it blopped onto my clean kitchen floor. The key to this mess is spinning. How fast it spins depends on how big the bread is. The bigger the bread, the slower the spin. Now, most bread, in fact, most of the things that you're likely to find on a kitchen counter spin at about the same rate. Like this, if I spread peanut butter and jelly on this book, there you go, and accidentally shove it off the edge of the counter, it lands jelly side down also. Bread 
has to be this small in order for it to have enough time to make a full revolution and land on the floor jelly side up. But I gotta eat like 25 of them before I can call it lunch. Now big bread will also land jelly side up, but it's gotta be about two feet across and you'd have to special order that. There is, however, a solution to the problem of the average sandwich. All you really need is a taller kitchen counter. If your kitchen counter is, say, oh, 10 feet above the ground, and your peanut butter sandwich accidentally slips off the side, it does have enough time to make one complete revolution, and thus will land jelly side up every time. I just love doing research. a raindrop? Not to worry, there are no soggy feet in this forecast. These compact little slickers fit comfortably over your shoes and ankles. Two quick zips and they have you covered. But best of all, these pristine puddle protectors are transparent and can weather any wardrobe challenge. Now what are these beauties up to? Why it's the latest twist in exercise. Waste away unwanted inches. Just step on the disc and rotate your way to a slimmer figure. Looks like these gals will be spinning their way into the newest dance craze. Oh my, a secretary's dream. Double your workload with this little setup. With this clever system, you can manage a call in each year, a letter for your boss, and never once lose your pencil. Now if we could just rig the coffee pot to a foot pedal. Our next guest acts like a tiger, growls like a tiger, but doesn't quite look like a tiger. Well, here to help us understand why that is, is naturalist Nancy Gibson. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you. Now, this does not look like a normal orange tiger that you think of when you think of tiger. What's no. the deal? Is this an albino? Well, it's not an albino because albino means it's a lack of color or pigment. And you know she's got beautiful blue eyes. Yeah, and she's got some of the eyes. brown stripes on her. Oh, and you can see she's a pretty good jumper, too. Um, she's a, a white Bengal tiger from India, and, but her home right now is at the Columbus Zoo. And she's about four months old. Her now, name is Lily. Lily White. Yes. Okay, now were both of Lily's parents white, and that's why she ended up being white? Yes, both of her parents uh, were white, but just to confuse the issue a little bit, all of her grandparents appeared to be that standard orange color. Now, how does that work? Okay, well, I'm going to give you a little lesson in genetics, okay? Okay, I'm ready. Okay. The color of a tiger is determined by a pair of genes. A cub receives one gene from each parent. Now, the two trade options are the standard orange color and white. In this case, the orange color is dominant and the white is recessive. The orange will always dominate over white, so the tiger may appear that standard color, but carry the white gene. So recessive means that both genes have to be white in order for the cub to be born white. Okay, so in Lily's case, it was pretty much a guaranteed outcome. Since right. her parents were white, the right. only gene she could get from them was right. that recessive white gene. Okay, we're going to just to keep her calm, I'm going to have to give her a little bit of milk. Okay? All right, you just go ahead and do that, Nancy. Sure. She definitely wants it. Yeah. She's in the a wild, hungry. a white tiger would not be very camouflaged, and so when they're trying to hunt, they can't hide behind yellow or brown bushes. Right. Well, that's certainly always been the, the standard theory. But when you really look into it a little bit further, you'll notice that, uh, or you'll probably know, that the prey species don't see in color. So they could, they'd still see the stripes, but it wouldn't really matter as to what color. Also, uh, tigers are nocturnal hunters. So uh, I don't think being the white color really makes that big a difference. But it ha they have determined that white tigers um, do have some problems with their uh, eyesight. Oh, it's part of the genetic uh, inherited uh, white color. Yes. Come uh, over here. Let's see if we can. She likes that bottle. You huh? want to try feeding her? All right. I'll give her a try. OK. Here, it's over here. Over now. here. Lily, it's right here. Lily. It's right here. There it is. See All right. She says, there. I want to make sure it's there. Right. I'll take care of the bottle. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. There you go. Now, what kind of animals do they hunt? Well, they have a variety of prey. Uh, they are some wild cattle and, and wild pigs and deer and antelope that they like to pounce on. But uh -huh. the main thing about tigers, in order for them to survive, they have to have adequate cover. And uh, they live, as I said, in the uh, uh, different regions of northern India. And in order for them to hunt, they have to be able to stalk or sneak up on their prey. 
and they'll get to say within several yards and using that very important cover, then they'll pounce or strike on really? top of their prey. So that's what these big paws are all about, right. huh? Very, well, she's also going to be a big tiger. Another interesting thing about white tigers is that they are actually a bit larger than the standard colored ones. How big? She's probably going to weigh about 350 pounds and she's full grown. That's plenty big. Yeah, that's, I'm glad that's, we've got her on the show now. <laughs> right, yeah, me too. <laughs> now, when you talk about uh, that hunting situation, what kind of range are they hunting over? Well, the males actually have quite a large range. I think it's like 40 square miles that they are uh, square kilometers. That's that they significant. Need. Right. The females is actually a little bit smaller, uh, but they need to have that wild habitat and a good source of prey. They miss on occasion, so they've oh, got to yeah. have plenty of options. Well, it's interesting. You think they're very efficient predators, but actually they're only successful 5 to 10% of the time. Really? Yeah. That's not a very good success no, rate, so they've no. got to have a lot of range right. and a lot of animals to hunt. Right. That's very true. Now, in that habitat situation, are, they, uh, are these animals endangered at all in their current habitat? There are eight subspecies of tigers. One of them's extinct, and the other seven are in dire <laughs> straits, and they're really having a tough time. Actually, the Bengal tiger is the most numerous, if you call two in the wild, numerous. Okay, so that's not a very good picture right no, now. No, Fortunately, no. Lily's uh, got a home for herself in the zoo and she loves bottled milk. Yes, she <laughs> certainly does. Nancy, thanks so much for giving us a close look up to that animal. It's this rare. Good. It's mm -hmm. all the time we have right now. We'll see you next time on Newton's Apple. <laughs> Newton's Apple is made possible by a grant from DuPont, supporting an interest in science today so that future generations may continue to enjoy better things for better living. And also by the financial support of viewers like you.